the bacterial steps are mostly ones. So, uh, and we haven't figured out yet how, how they manage these high recoveries, even though they, they don't seem to kind of, uh, to look like too, too pendulous in their, in their gates here. That's something that, that we are still working on. Uh, what we know is that uh, kind of the mechanical, the percent mechanical recovery tracks closely the congruity. So, so here's a plot of recovery rates over congruity. So the, the amount of potential and kinetic energy fluctuate out of phase, that would be the, the, the left side of the graph, that would be the rolling egg, and, and you know, in phase. And you see kind of the higher uh, the congruity is, the lower the, lower the recovery rates, and the molecular steps are all at the, tail, at the tail end right here. Um, and uh, finally, center of mass work. So, so what, what do the muscles have to have to do to kind of uh, make the to accelerate the, the, the center of mass? And and that center of mass work is about three times higher for the bipedal steps than for the quadrupedal steps at at comparable speeds. So, so in quadrupedal uh, steps, the kind of the work only goes up at the very high speeds here during gallops. So let's suggest that uh, Capuchin bipedalism is, is not a very kind of, uh, energy efficient game, at least when you judge from, from the work that has to be done on the center of mass. Um, and I get back to that, there are other sources of work that, uh, that have to be done, but before I go there, I want, want to give you an idea of what other data we have on, on primate bipedalism. And it's actually uh, uh, precious few uh, species have, have been studied. We know that a lot of primates, you know, in the context especially of tool use uh, 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 and carrying, uh, use bipedal gates. They don't uh, use it often, some, some use it more often than others. Capuchins are up there, chimpanzees you, in the wild you see quite often using bipedal gates. And these are two of the species that we have lab data for. Gibbons, when they come on the ground, uh, walk by Pili. That has to do with the, the, the length of their, their forelimbs. They are so long that they virtually hit the ground when they, when they walk. So they're using them like, like rope walkers like this to balance themselves. But uh, Gibbons, uh, in the wild, you rarely see coming to the ground. So this is a typical zoo situation. But the gibbon is here because we have, we have some experimental data all these animals. And strange enough, we have experimental data on baboons, even though they rarely use bipedal gates, and usually it's you know, kind of, uh, for, for something like this here, to, um, which is not, not quite a natural situation. Uh, but a, a French group has, has trained some baboons uh, in a zoo to kind of walk bipedal, and so we have data on them. And the, the last uh, species that we have some lab data on, uh, on bipedalism are Japanese macaques. And in Japan, there's a long tradition to train animals to walk bipedally over long, dis over long distances and times uh, for uh, yeah, their circus performers. And, and these animals, they, they are then quite easily transferred into, into a lab uh, and, and do their bipedal business there. And, uh, Japanese macaques in the wild sometimes uh, 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 walk bipedally again for transporting and for tool use. They are the famous uh, the Japanese macaques that wash sweet potatoes. They wash the dirt off the sweet potatoes before they eat them. And to do that, they get up on their two legs so they walk to they walk to, to the next water source and then they, they do the, the cleaning business. Uh, so, so these five species are virtually the only species that we have in the laboratory data uh, on for, for their bipedal gates. And let's, let's look at what we have. It's not complete data sets for all of them, but for all of these guys we have, we have some kinematic data. And if you look across here, they all use a gate with a bent knee. The knee is never fully extended. They all use a gate uh, with a, a bent or flexed hip, so all use bent, bent knee, bent, bent hip gates. Center of mass mechanics we don't have for all of these species. You know we know for the capuchins the recovery is low. Uh, 
uh, we know for the macaques, there are no uh, recovery data published, but uh, the, the center of mass energy fluctuations are in phase. Uh, no, no baboon data. For the gibbons, uh, the recovery rates are low. For the chimpanzees, they are highly variable, but on average also, also low. So, so we don't have rolling eggs in, in, in this collection of, of bipedal primates, bipedal primates either. So then, then let's revisit, you know, kind of the energetics of of uh, uh, primate bipedalism. Now I've looked at uh, kind of several species and pretty much you know identified that they all kind of do something similar. They kind of you know, they they walk bent bent hip bent knee, and they their center of mass energetics uh, doesn't fluctuate out of phase like in human walking. Um, so so the next question is. Do they, do they use running gates? Do they bounce and use a spring mechanism like, like we do when we, when we uh, run? Yes, we know the center of mass energy, they fluctuate, they fluctuate pretty much in phase. They have vertical movement, vertical, vertical movement that uh, all the center of mass that are compatible with the uh, spring mechanisms. So center of mass drops during the first phase of sta stands. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they get a recoil out of their tendons. And determining you know, whether, whether kind of you have a recoil action and, and true elastic storage and release is actually a fairly involved business. And it requires some, some invasive research where you not only track the forces that muscles develop, but you also have to track the, the lengthening and shortening of muscle fibers. And that requires to put little sensors into uh, the muscle to sonar micrography, and nobody has done that in primates so far. So we are waiting for this data to, to actually determine whether kind of these length tension changes of muscles kind of follow a pattern that lends it itself to elastic recoil versus you know kind of is more characteristic of muscles that, that develop active force. However, if you just look at primate anatomy, all primates have prehensile hands and feet. And in order to operate these prehensile hands and feet, they, they, they kind of the flexors that, that they use to kind of uh, curl their, their, their toes and fingers, they have to have long muscle fibers because they go over several joints in order to kind of you know, be able to kind of flex all of these joints, they have to shorten quite a bit, which means that the muscle bellies have to be long. And that also means, implies that the tendons of these muscles are short. And we know that tendons are the, the number one materials you know, where animals that use elastic recoil store that energy. So they are, they are the major springs in, in the limb here that, that are first stretched out and then, and then release that energy. And if you look at an, at an animal that, that uses, uh, uses elastic storage and recoil like a horse, and there are lots of them, they usually come with the good runners, you know, come with the long limbs, uh, and things like kangaroos, for example. They, they have super long tendons here. They don't have, they don't have prehensile, uh, prehensile feet or, or hands, and very short muscle bellies. And these short mus muscle bellies do nothing but regulate the tension in that, in that tendon spring. Whereas, so that's this pattern here, whereas long muscle bellies they are more characteristic of, of, of generating active force, of contracting to kind of, uh, kind of make, make uh, the, the, the joint, joint angles change here and, and, and here. So I believe that this anatomy alone kind of is, 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 uh, uh, is, suggest, is not suggestive of elastic storage in, in primates. So even though we don't have direct data right now, I don't think primates are bouncing, are bouncing balls either. Um, so, so, so far we talked about center of mass mechanics and pendulums and springs, but they are really not the only factors that drive us in, in locomotion. First of all, um, when, we, when we walk and run, we swing our limbs back and forth and if you look at my forelimbs, what we do, especially when we run, you know, we move them in opposite directions. So we perform movements with them that doesn't, that don't make the center of mass move. So they, they cancel each 